using is in this case. So just briefly this evening is to, to, to focus on these four main areas, and that is talking about the allergy-focused diet history. I'm going to briefly touch on diagnostic tools. I'm going, hoping that Dr. Val will touch that on that more. Um, and then to talk about how does one eliminate the most common food allergies, which is cow's milk, peanut, and eggs. And then very important is just to quickly touch on then the nutritional concerns when it comes to food allergies. So then where does one start? That's always the troubling thing. You have a patient who appears and, rep and reports these multiple food allergies and one just doesn't know where to start. And the very obvious and easy point to start is getting a good allergy focused diet history, which allows you then to determine what foods you would like to test when it comes to the food specific IG levels or doing a skin prick test and very much what helps a lot is then doing oral food challenges. So step one is very much, like I said, an allergy-focused diet history. It helps to do, it involves a good clinical and diet history linking your allergens and the symptoms. So that's very much your first approach. And what it very much entails about is the, the um, clinical history on, so actual history of the patient, is there any family history, um, if they're avoiding the food and why are they particularly avoiding the food, what are those reactions to that particular food, and even detailing, getting those kind of um, nitty gritties about what happens when they have reaction to the food. So what are the symptoms? At what age when it first occurred? Um, does it happen frequently? Um, when you give it back to them, uh, when you have repeated exposure, does it have the same outcome? Um, did they seek immediate medical attention? So the details is fundamental to help you with your diagnosis. And also to keep in mind the other extrinsic factors, like keeping in mind, that is there any infection that involved at that point in time of medication that could have contributed to the symptoms? But allergy-focused diet is it doesn't stop just at the point of first consultation to know what has happened. It also helps a lot with your follow-up visits to help you understand and see if the symptoms are being controlled. And very importantly, is to determine the compliance with the elimination diet. But for me, probably the most important aspect is to actually assess the nutritional adequacy. So it's very easy to eliminate things, but are we actually then providing alternatives that meet the needs of the child? So tools are anything from a symptom food diary, which we use often. It could be a 24-hour recall if you don't have a, the ability to do symptom food diary or three-day foods uh, frequency. In infants, it requires very detailed diet history. And one needs to know what has happened from the moment of birth right to up to the point that you see them for the first time. These kind of questions involves like type of feeding since birth. Um, so that length of time that they had a particular formula if they're not being breastfed. Um, the volumes um, given during day and night. Mixing is fundamental. Um, the age where they introduce solids. What did they start with? Including what consistencies do they like? Um, do they like more of a pureed? Um, are we going into the more um, uh, complex, um, more textured type of consistencies? Um, what types of foods, the food groups to go through them? Um, and then remembering other fluids and not just about food. And very importantly, families like the over-the-counter supplements. So know if that's also be given as well. Meal times, the number of meals, and how, and the composition of the meals is also important when you take diet histories. This is just an example of a tool that I use for helping with symptom food diary. It very much in, gives details on um, the time, so because it needs to be both day and night. The column that it tells you the food, so it needs to give a little bit more detail of what the actual meals consist of. Brands help a lot because a brand plays a huge part in if it's with different types of food. The quantity is important and giving them simple things like spoons, cups to help them measure and give an idea of quantities. The symptoms, of course, is very important, detailing that as well. And then also other things that's very important is actually who made the food? Did this happen at Granny's place? Did this happen at your own home? Um, and just general things about their well-being as well. Um, this can be done, this needs to be typically done at the normal week, ideally, but it's ideally also to include weekends as well. So ideally, roughly about seven days, consecutive days, helps a lot. So the benefits is very much um, to help to get the detail, so knowing the quantity and the quality and the period of the time, helps to identify nutritional deficiencies, 
very important is the hidden allergens so things that families would have never thought that could have been a problem food might have been a problem food um, and then also knowing the different forms is it raw or is it baked um, heat treated um, and then also determine trends on events did it happen at certain time of days and days of the week are there any environmental stresses that could have contributed as well so that's very much the diet history. So the next step is now, now you've got an idea of what potential foods could have been a problem. And one could then, then consider some tests. And um, very important, this is just a guiding process. It's not a diagnostic tool. It helps you to, to give, give you some direction of which way to go. Um, of course, it's just to measure IG, EG mediated allergy foods. And of course, if your history is clear, then you can actually test those specific foods. If the history is not clear, then one can measure the most common foods or suspected foods. And then ideally, of course, no antihistamines three to five days prior to the, to the skin prep test. Uh, just a table illustrating the difference, um, just to say skin prep tests are easier to do, inexpensive, more practical, if you have an immediate response to it. Um, your specific IGs are, of course, a little bit more expensive. Um, there's delay, you have to wait for your results to come out. But this, you're not concerned about the influence of the skin condition here as opposed to that with a skin prick test um, as well. So those are the typical um, um, difference between the two. For uh, step three is something that we do often and it really helps the diagnosis as well. It's almost considered like a gold standard for, um, um, for your particular IgE mediated. It needs to be in a setting with your well, resuscitation equipment. Um, your vitals gets monitored. Um, it's great for those type of histories that are unclear and you just don't know which direction to go. And it will also help to use it when you want to reintroduce a particular food after you've done a period of elimination. So now what are the common foods that I'll uh, be discussing? It's cow's milk, peanuts and egg for the purpose of this evening. So cow's milk allergy, it's common in your first three years of life. The main proteins are casein and whey, um, and all forms of cow's milk is being avoided, not like you would do with lactose intolerance. Um, casein, it's good to know these components, because casein is heat stable and whey, and whey is heat labile. It just helps you sometimes if you want to have the options of wanting to introduce baked uh, products or not. Um, it's important to read labels with all food allergies is to understand read labels and look for those hidden products in the ingredients and look for typical components or terms that could link to your cows with protein like whey, casein, lactose, lactoglobulin and anything usually that has lacto attached to it usually would suggest that it's got a cow's milk protein attached to it. What helps a lot with legislation in place is that they are obliged to actually list these common um, allergens as well. Um, Bear in mind, cow's milk protein um, is a very important group in infants, therefore making them at risk. With breastfed infants, one would always encourage them to continue, and sometimes you would consider maternal, um, the diet of the mother to, re to eliminate the cow's milk if you find severe cases. Um, milk alternatives needs to be clearly offered for the non-breastfed infants. The choice very much depends on the severity of the reaction, Religion is a big component as well because certain products are not halal certified, for example. Also, one needs to keep in mind aspects around cultural considerations and the cost is a big factor as well. That once you go to more specialized products, the cost is hugely increased for what the families are used to and it changes the palatability of the formula as well. So those are things that one needs to bear in mind as well. So when choosing milk alternatives for these um, infants that are formula fed, these are the typical ways of kind of breaking it up. So you've got rig and it's really much based on the protein components or protein size of the formula. For example, regular infant formula, you'll see this uh, normal whole protein. So all your peptides, your amino acids are all stringing into one. Then you get the different classifications of formula based on that, um, that concept of the size of the protein or the amino acids that are present and how it's being broken up. So you'll get your first step, which is your HA milk. And this is your partially hydrolyzed formula. This is not for the management of cows with um, allergies. It's more for a possibility of prevention. 
so that it is not used at all for cows or protein um, management. The next option would be your extensively hydrolyzed protein. So now your protein components are much more smaller. And these are the ones that we tend to consider for your options for your treatment. The next option would be also is then pure amino acids. So there's absolutely no causal protein present in these type of formulas. And something that is I have included is your soya-based formulas. And these are usually only really considered if we have proven to actually tolerate. So some patients can still have a soya allergy as well. So unless proven to be tolerated, we would then consider soya um, protein formula as an option for, for causal protein allergy. Just to step back a little bit, so the amino acids would be considered um, simply because after failure of the extensor hydrolyzed protein um, formula, um, simply because it's still a component of, um, of a causal protein, which is the residual lipoglobulin that is detected in your extensor hydrolyzed protein um, formula. Hence, that's when amino acids might be considered. I want to highlight um, the alternative milks, your uh, animal milk alternatives, which is actually unsuitable for the management of causal protein allergy. And this is just an illustration of the protein breakdown of the different animal milk um, alternatives. If you'll see on the one end, um, it explains, um, it shows you the picture of the protein breakdown of cow's milk. And if you move right across, you'll see that it kind of almost looks very similar in its makeup. So it makes absolutely no sense, which is commonly used for, for um, cows allergy is goat milk. They're very much similar in the protein profile. So hence we do not um, recommend goat milk as a means of uh, managing cows and protein allergy in these type of patients. Looking at plant-based milk alternatives, only ever would I consider this type of product if it's for older children and they're eating a well-balanced diet. And it also, what I mean, one needs to consider for these plant-based milk alternatives is to make sure that they have calcium and vitamin D added to them as well. Um, so that's your calcium allergy. If you want to move on to egg allergy, um, this also occurs commonly in your infants, particularly even with those with calcium allergy and peanuts. The white of the egg is the main protein causing the allergy, and it consists of ovipoid, oval um, albumin, ovotransferrin, and lysosome. Some may react to the egg yolk too, therefore all forms of it is used to be avoided initially. Some develop tolerance to baked forms, such as biscuits and cakes, and we usually would advise this after a successful oral food challenge. Reading labels, once again, is fundamental, and taken from the Allergy Foundation um, of South Africa's um, website, um, on the patient education tools, you'll see there are a nice list of um, terms to look out for when reading actual um, labels um, um, of products. Um, so this is just another illustration of typical foods that might have egg. For example, sweet, something that one would never have thought be problematic as a sweet, also needs to be considered. I've had patients that who has egg allergy reacting to marshmallows. So one needs to, to educate families very clearly that it's not sometimes the most obvious forms of egg that they would see, that they need to read labels and look more for hidden forms of allergies as well. Processed meats particularly is a very common one as well. Egg is used at times as a binder for processed meats. So that also needs to be considered. So your sausages um, or your burgers might very well have egg in them as well. Um, that they need to consider as a hidden form of allergy as well when it comes to egg allergies. For peanut allergies, also common in children, um, these are the ones that tend to have anaphylaxis. So peanut is a member of your legume family and it's related to soybean, lentils, garden peas and chickpeas. So there's this 5 to 10 chance of actually reacting to the other um, groups as well. Um, Avoidance of all forms of peanuts is, of course, is, is needs to be done when with the management and confirmed peanut allergy. One needs to once again read labels. There's great confusion with families about the term used may contain traces of peanuts. And this really much is an indication of a possible just a cross contamination of peanuts in the manufacturing process. So sometimes the product itself 
might not have actual peanuts in it, but they will have the term of may contain traces of peanuts. So sometimes I reassure families that that is just the company safeguarding themselves to actually put there about the possibility of cross-contamination. And this is very much for your severe forms of peanut allergies, where they actually do even react to these kind of traces and traces of peanuts in a product as well. So that is to educate them and just warn them. So sometimes I have patients who actually tolerate eating the, food, the foods that has the term on, and I advise them to continue if they are actually tolerating the product. Um, so tree nuts are different to peanuts, such as pecan, walnut, hazelnut, almond, cashew, and macadamias. And this would also only be avoided if actually um, reported to be problematic or if there was any testing done. So uh, for uh, reading labels, um, once again, taken from Allergy Foundation of South Africa, clearly nicely explaining of hidden foods and things to consider when it comes to peanut allergies. So very important is to know now is that you now are the process of eliminating, you've counseled them on avoidance, you've provided alternatives, and now one needs to keep in mind the compliance. The next thing to consider is, is that growth is a fundamental component as well. And one needs to keep in mind the micronutrient deficiency and the feeding filter can also can play a huge part as part of your management. So growth and development um, is very much an important um, aspect when it comes to food allergies, particularly in children. They have risk of developing um, growth faltering simply because of things about delayed diagnosis of the food allergies. So families tend to eliminate a host of foods for long periods of, of time and have not actually seeked advice. Um, or it could be at the time or the, uh, of, of, of actually eliminating. So at the onset of a disease, for example, if it's done in infancy, when it's the most important time for growth and development. When you have multiple food allergies, you have a, whole, a host of food items and families are left with nothing or feel that they have nothing left to give or offer their child. So these can impact on growth as well. And then other aspects like um, milk, milk being a central food for infants. So that can impact on growth as well. So trust the dietitian to actually help with the management. Um, will we play the role of accessing the growth, making sure that they're not avoiding unnecessary foods and that tends to happen as well. So once we've actually determined what the food culprits are, that they need to be reassured it's only those foods and that no other food should be avoided. They're provided with a practical advice and diet sheets of what alternatives to give, to make sure that the needs are being met. And we monitor the pattern, um, we look at for feeding difficulties, always making sure of adequacy. And always very important is reminding and having a plan of reintroducing the food back later. Because many times it gets forgotten for years later and we've never readdressed about reintroducing the foods. So just reinforce again, it's about nutritional assessment, looking at the anthro, plotting them accordingly and classifying. And it's very important is to constantly monitor the growth trends. Looking at the macronutrients, important is about the energy and the protein. Um, you know, so they having the right ratio of your energy and your protein needs to ensure this catch up growth at good lean body mass. We need to remember that these foods that are eliminated are high biological types of protein. So your cow's milk and your egg and your fish they are very important forms of protein. So one needs to provide alternatives to ensure that they're getting adequate essential amino acids as well. Um, bear in mind, so when we give alternatives like vegetable protein, one needs to keep in mind that it's only 10 to 20% lower bioavailability. So one needs to remember that when we do alternatives, that it's adequate and it meets the needs of the child. So looking at micronutrients, which is also sometimes gets forgotten, um, and if you look at the risks of nutritional deficiencies in the typical common food allergies, if you look at cow's milk allergy for one, it is a common um, micronutrient, it's calcium, vitamin D, vitamin A that you get from cow's milk. So if you eliminate it, you're placing them at risk for these micronutrients, for example. And being in South Africa, we have a concern around micronutrient deficiencies, particularly with vitamin A, we are deficient, we are anemic, iron deficient anemia, and zinc as well. So when we eliminate foods, we need to keep micronutrients in mind as well. 
So when also identifying nutritional deficiencies, one needs to think of other things that also could contribute to growth faltering. So bear in mind things like anemia, if you could do your HB and MC levels, electrolytes for growth factors, keeping in mind your magnesium and your calcium when it comes to calcium allergy, your iron levels, vitamin D and zinc levels are useful, especially when you're experiencing malnutrition and you're not going forward with, um, with your patients. Calcium, very important. It's part of bone and teeth development. We all know this. Um, so the alternative foods other than cow's milk would be your green leafy vegetables, fish bones, so the bones in pulchards, and sometimes your enriched alternative milks. When it comes to green leafy vegetables, you really need to eat buckets and buckets loads of broccoli or spinach to actually get the value of calcium needs. So sometimes in these patients, one needs to consider supplementation to meet the daily needs of the patient. Same thing with vitamin D, comes with cows, well, comes from eggs as well. One needs to keep in mind it plays a huge role in many functions in your body, and one needs to maybe consider supplementation if needed. This is just a table to show that it's easy enough to say, yes, have alternative plant-based forms of milk, but they vary in your calcium and your vitamin D levels. So if it's being given, one needs to still bear in mind the volume that needs to be given in order to ensure that they get enough calcium and vitamin D levels as well. So looking at feeding difficulties, this is just a brief, just a reminder. Find very enough to eliminate these um, diets for these patients, but it can happen for years. And what I find with patients, they actually develop some form of feeding difficulty at some, time, at some point in time. Because... If you look at children when, or your infants, when cow's milk or wheat even is get eliminated during important times, they develop certain habits around eating. When you give them specialized diets, which has particular taste and, and, and there's limited variety and different foods allowed, it just makes them more preference to certain foods and they actually develop a little bit of fussy eating down the line. So that really much just concludes very much my basic approach and I hope I gave it as basic as possible, not skipping too much. But it's really a much thorough investigation of diagnosing it. Um, involves your clinical and diet history. Very important to help interpret um, or, or try and help um, with interpretation of related investigations. Then you do your elimination diets, which is the cornerstone to managing your food allergies. Here you need to have ongoing counseling and ensure compliance to prevent any further symptoms. It's also important that children receive adequate nutrition um, so that they maintain optimal growth and development. And ongoing monitoring and evaluation is fundamental. And to remember the nutritional disorders that they are at risk for, looking at poor growth, looking at micronutrient deficiencies, and bearing in mind that we do not want them to develop any kind of feeding difficulty or fussy eating down the line. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Shiam. That was really interesting. And thank you for giving us your contact details. Um, I'm just wondering if there's anybody who's got any questions for us. And um, I'm going to stop sharing. And uh, there we go. And uh, any questions for Shiam? often we have no questions. <laughs> uh, there is one, sorry, apologies. I see a hand up, Jawaya. Hi, um, I'm sorry I had to join a little bit late because I was coming from another meeting. So I missed out on a bit, but I'm actually wanting to ask a question around um, um, gluten allergies. Shyam, thanks for a really great and insightful um, presentation. Can, can um, gluten allergies be um, resolved? Last so, question, Joaya. Thank you for that. So, yeah, so, so gluten, uh, so gluten intolerance, um, depending on what you're looking at. So if you're looking at wheat allergy, which is the protein component, um, which is a different pathway, if you, and if you're looking at gluten intolerance, which is something like celiac disease, um, so it very much depends on what you're trying to determine because they're very different from each other.
Jim, I think from my point of view, just a quick question about peanut allergies. So, so one thing parents, I think, are very nervous about. Uh, where are we going in the world with that? Because I know there's quite a lot of research happening around it. Any other comments on peanut allergy? So I, I can't tell you about prevalence. I just can tell you that it's definitely one of the common foods. Um, it tends to be the one that seems to outgrow longer. Um, so your cow's milk and the egg are fine. They are the ones who tend to outgrow sooner and peanuts tends to linger longer. Um, but Peter maybe can add a little bit more about the, the prevalence and where we're going with it. Great, fantastic. Any other questions, guys? Maybe, maybe there'll be some more for Shiam at the end after Peter Deval's talk. So um, thank you very much, Shiam. Um, really great to have you on our webinar. Um, definitely one of our more favorite pedi uh, uh, pediatric dietitians. So thank you for that. So the next um, person is uh, Peter Deval, who is going to continue along the same theme. Peter, if you'd like to load your slides, if you are using slides. Great, and prevention and weaning strategies along the same um, lines. So if you just make it into a presentation, fantastic. Um, and the floor is all yours. Thanks, thanks Mignon, and thanks Beira for the opportunity to talk. Um, I'm going to focus on food allergy prevention. I think Shiam touched on a lot of uh, diagnostic tools and treatment. I think the important thing People are welcome to ask questions, but I think when it comes to food allergy diagnosis, I think a good history, and then obviously the skin prick testing and IgE testing may be very useful and helpful, but I think the moment you've got those results and it at all shows that there is sensitization, I think it's important to speak to someone regarding, or someone that knows a bit about food allergy, um, and fortunately in South Africa, we've got so many people that have has done their, or have done their, their diploma in allergy. And um, uh, major cities and, and uh, um, treatment hubs in South Africa now has got an allergist. So I think the important message for us today is that people should discuss these results and uh, not just make diagnosis on their own. I think allergy diagnosis is quite complicated and especially when you look at blood results or skin, skin prick test results, it can be quite confusing. And things like positive predicted values and sensitization versus true allergy are quite important concepts that people uh, should, should remember. So please discuss these results with one of us and um, uh, I will help you with that. So I'm gonna be talking about food allergy prevention uh, so uh, Mignon asked the question, how are we doing with regards to, to peanut allergy in South Africa? I think I want to highlight two studies from South Africa. The first study is a, um, is a study, or both of them are actually from, from, from Red Cross. I just want to minimize. Yes, I just, uh, so, so the first one is a, is a study in selected children from, from Red Cross, which attended the Red Cross Dermatology Clinic with uh, moderate to severe atopic dermatitis. And it has been found quite alarmingly high numbers of, of children sensitized to at least one food and then went on to, to have oral food challenge proven allergy. So I think the important message here, we as a developing country or a second or third world country are not that far behind when it comes to statistics like, like uh, uh, the Australians and, and the Americas. So uh, allergy are no longer, or food allergy specifically, is no longer considered to just be a, a westernized or a developed uh, 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 condition. 25% of our children that attended that clinic in this study was allergic to egg, and about 24% was allergic to peanut. So there's quite important lessons that was, that was learned out of that study. And first of all, it seems like black African or Torsa children that attended that clinic had high levels of sensitization, but slightly lower uh, rates of, of true food allergy. Um, and I think important lessons were learned about the risk factors for food allergy. And that is that severity of eczema and eczema before six months of age was quite predictive in children with, with, with food allergy. 
The second study, what I what I want or that I want to highlight is the one, the CEFA or the South African Food Sensitization and Food Allergy Study, a well-known study now that we've learned a lot of lessons from, a big study, uh, uh, 1,200 children. And the SAFA study quite eloquently uh, showed that children between the age of three, one to three years of age, if you compare a rural cohort with an urban co cohort, had quite different sensitization and food allergy rates. So I think the important lesson here from South Africa is that allergy and sensitization, sensitization rates were much higher in the rural versus urban children. So when it comes to food allergy, prevention strategies, I think it's quite important to recognize this urban versus rural gradient and also this, this, this race discrepancy that we often see in, in, in food, food allergy and other allergies. And this is pretty much in line with what they also found in European and American studies. Um, so if you look at the bottom, at the, at the bottom uh, um, part of this, that slide, that's the red, the red ones. And those are your allergy protective strategies or mechanisms or, or environmental factors that has been shown to protect you against specifically food allergy and other allergies. So those are helminth infection, quite interesting population or global populations with high helminth or parasitic infection seems to, to be protected against allergy, large family sizes, attending a daycare facility, early life common infections. And then quite interesting, we found, or they found that pet pets specifically indoor pets wasn't as bad as we previously thought. And then specifically growing up on a farm, being exposed to environmental farm uh, factors seems to be protective. And there's a lot that's been written about farm animal exposure, raw milk consumption, and people are thinking about this whole microbiome or microbial diversity exposure. And it, it boils down back, boils back to the, to the hygiene hypothesis that we that we, that we explored many years ago. And people are thinking that we are simply just growing up in a too much or sterile environment. The top part of this, of this slide shows then things that can promote allergy or that increase your allergy risk. And these are single children in, in a family born via cesarean section, being exposed either antenatally or very early in life to antibiotics. And once again, your diet being more westernized, urbanized, no breastfeeding, pasteurized milk consumption, and then this whole concept of lay diversification of, 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 of early life diet. So the gut microbiome or the gastrointestinal microbiome is now being explored extensively. And there's numerous studies that's coming out that's showing that children with food allergy have has actually, or have actually a distinct gut microbiome composition uh, globally. It, it, with an increased richness and diversity in the gut microbiome, it seems to be protective. And then the Canada or the child, uh, the Canadian cohort showed that richness at three months, but not at, a year, at one year was associated with food sensitization. So this really boils down to a very early window of opportunity. And people are now exploring this first thousand days or even before one year that we have now to get things right get the microbiome rich and diverse, and then obviously favorable to prevent specifically food allergy. Quite an important concept that people are looking at, and um, they are also exploring this when it comes to bovine or to cow's milk, is this interim memory pathway. So the interim memory pathway basically explains how, how gut microbia or from the, from the mum or from the maternal intestine finds their way into the um, um, mammarian gland and then ultimately gets, gets consumed by the, by the infant. Obviously the infant oral microbiota or oral inf infant microbiome plays an important role and also the breast skin microbiome plays an important role um, to, to what, what eventually lands up in the, in the infant's uh, gastrointestinal tractus. And people are thinking that these mechanisms all plays a role in protecting against specifically food allergy. So I think it's important to re-evaluate and re-explore this whole concept of maybe that indoor farm animals are quite uh, protective. And this is maybe our urbanized uh, community. Maybe this is our way of getting exposed more to a farm or an or a, or a environmental microbiome as we see in a farm exposure. 
So uh, I think it's important that we revisit this whole thing of indoor cats and dogs just being bad. And if you look at those phyla that's been identified um, in, in these pets, it's, it's a lot of these phylums have, has also been identified as being allergy protective or food allergy protective. The microbiome is now extensively researched. People are looking at diet, a, a high fiber diet. People are looking at probiotics and prebiotics and then even combining these pre and probiotics into what we call symbiotics. And then also people are looking at uh, fecal uh, um, transplants or microbiome transplant. But unfortunately, these are still in its infant years and, people, and, and it still remains a topic of, of ongoing research. I think Shiham has also touched on this, and this is this dual allergen exposure hypothesis that's been proposed by Gideon, Gideon Lack way back in 2008. And basically, it, it explains that we as humans are not supposed to see our allergens through a skin. So if we have through our skin, so if we have a broken skin, if our skin barrier is disrupted, allergens like milk and peanut and egg, even environmental aeroallergens are seen through the skin and then eventually that can lead to a Th2 high or an or a immune Th2 immune dominated allergic immune response leading to allergy, as opposed to oral exposure, where eventually everything that we inhale, everything that we swallow or eat eventually ends up in the gut. And this is the way that we are designed. Our immune system is designed to see things through our gastrointestinal and our mesenteric lymph nodes. So this eventually then upregulates your Th2 immune system leading to tolerance. So important from this slide to remember, when you see a child with a disrupted skin barrier, in other words, eczema, it's important to aggressively treat that eczema to, to prevent ongoing exposure. So what is the best available or what are the best available evidence or foods that we have that we have at the moment? We've got good evidence now for egg, milk and peanut prevention. We've got good evidence specifically before the age of, of one year. And unfortunately, the evidence only exists for IgE mediated food allergy and for high risk children. We don't have any concrete or robust evidence in preventing non IgE mediated disease. I don't want to bore you too much about statistics, but there's important lessons that, that we are learning. And I think when it comes to a topic like preventing allergy or food allergy prevention, I think we need to look at, at, at evidence based. Uh, trials and evidence-based recommendations rather than what's been just put on the internet and, and on, on, on Facebook. So let's look at the first study, the landmark study, the learning earlier, uh, learning earlier about peanut study from the UK that took children basically from four to 11 months, exposed them to peanut from the age of about four months, two grams of peanut three times a week. And then eventually they have shown that these children had a far or a, in, uh, a far less risk or the prevalence was decreased dramatically when they reassessed them at about five months of age. So once again, just note, this is from a UK developed country. So um, how much of these we can extrapolate to us is still debatable, but I think it's an important concept. The EAT study, they were very brave. They took standard risk children, which were exclusively breastfed. And then they introduced all these so-called highly allergenic foods from, from three months. So remember, pretty much as our current strategy is to, 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 uh, to, to introduce these things after or these foods after six months of age, they were quite brave. They introduced it from three months of age. And they also showed in their per protocol analysis that they could significantly uh, uh, decrease the prevalence of specific peanut and uh, uh, egg allergy in the children that consumed these foods rather than the children that avoided them. There's a lot of studies that was done on egg allergy. I think the BEAT study from Australia and the Petit trial from Japan were the most dramatic or told us the most uh, uh, um, robust, had the most robust evidence. And that is that uh, uh, children that consumed egg from anything from about six to nine months fairly early, extensively heated egg, were also being shown was also being were also being shown to have less significant egg sensitization and egg allergy when they were assessed at 12 months of age. So once again, fairly early introduction of these so-called highly allergenic foods. Maybe just to note, some of these studies were were terminated prematurely because 
foods or less extensively heated forms of egg had uh, uh, um, that give children or gave these children anaphylaxis and they had severe adverse effects or side effects of these of these uh, uh, of, of less extensively heated forms of egg so it's quite important to remember that um, when you introduce these foods it should be at least highly or extensively heated uh, and and baked so it, it can be quite dangerous to lose a less uh, um, to use a less extensively heated form of egg then there's just two trials i, I want to highlight on preventing eczema so as you all know or as you all know, eczema is often when we talk about the, 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 the food or we talk about the allergy march or the, the, uh, the allergic march, eczema is often seen with food allergy very early in life and it's often the first, um, the tip of the iceberg or, the, or it's often the first red flag of a child developing food allergy and later in life, aero allergy, uh, uh, aero allergy sensitization. So this study from the UK and USA shown, has shown that high risk newborns with a family history of eczema from birth to about six months when they were, uh, 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 when they, their skin barrier were, was protected by applying an emollient had a dramatic or a relative risk reduction of eczema at about six months of age. So once again, protecting the newborn skin is quite important. This study was from, from Japan, once again, fairly high risk neonates with a family mem member of eczema or a sibling with eczema from birth to about four months of age, once again shown that it dramatically decreased the risk of, of eczema when a daily moisturizer was uh, uh, applied very early in life. And quite interesting that egg sensitization rates were significantly higher in infants who had atopic dermatitis and eczema just highlighting this whole principle of atopic eczema or atopic dermatitis or eczema fairly early in life, um, uh, uh, predisposing you to, to, to food allergy later in life. Pretty much the same as Professor Claudia Gray did with her infants um, in, the, in the dermatology clinic. So there's now hot off the press fairly new guidelines. That's the European um, Allergy and Asthma and Clinical Immunology published a few months back. It's still for public review, but it's probably going to uh, be seen uh, uh, um, in an accepted guideline form. So here they basically uh, uh, identify an early window of opportunity of introducing solid to promote oral tolerance, not before three months because of concerns of gut immaturity, but definitely not delaying as we did in the past, uh, these food uh, introduction after the year it's regarded as too late. So the optimum weaning time is now recognized as anything between four and six months, but it is important to recognize or to do some sort of risk stratification in the child. In other words, take a good history, find out if there's any uh, eczema, was it present from a very young age? Are there any or, uh, already existing food allergies? And what are the family history regarding allergy and specifically food allergy? And then after that, you can you can basically introduce even highly allergenic foods when you think it's safe. So this is typically what I see maybe in a week on a, in a, on a weekly basis in my office. So pediatrician's dilemma, this is a young couple and this is often the vignette that we give to pediatric registrars and to, to uh, uh, pre-graduates about uh, uh, allergy prevention. It's a mom of 34 weeks pregnant. She's here today because their four-year-old boy already has severe eczema and peanut allergy. And then she wants to know from you, is there anything she can do to prevent this newborn from developing basically or embarking on the same journey as her four-year-old brother did? And what can you advise them? So let's look at a few practic practical strategies. So I think when I think or when I give advice on allergy prevention, I always try and sort of subcategorize different stages of this uh, child's or the, inf or, the, or the fetus development and eventually ending up into the uh, uh, into the solid introduction phase. So there's there's some strategies we can advise them on antenatal uh, uh, um, prevention of food allergy. We can promote breastfeeding. Talk a little bit about uh, formula feeding, applying of your moisturizer, maybe avoiding early antibiotics, and then eventually introducing solids and how they should do it. 
So let's look at some of them, the maternal diet and supplementation. So nowadays it's actually advised not, or you should not advise any mom to eliminate highly allergenic food. Doesn't matter how severe your family history or your previous child's reaction is. You should not ever diagnose or tell a mom to eliminate highly allergenic foods. Mom should follow a normal, diverse and a balanced diet and then careful uh, uh, monitoring of the maternal and fetal weight. We don't want mom and baby or, inf or, or fetus to gain weight too fast. That has been shown to, to, to increase your risk of specifically food uh, or, or um, food allergy. So what about maternal supplementation? There's numerous studies, studies done on omega-3, fatty acids, oily fish, those type of things. And um, observational studies, small observational studies showed that maternal diet high in oily fish and dairy products may reduce atopic dermatitis, not food allergy, but atopic dermatitis and asthma in the offspring. Unfortunately, probiotics, a lot that has been written on probiotics currently with vitamin D supplementation has not been shown to really make a difference and there's current, in, currently insufficient evidence to support it. What about breastfeeding? We all know breast is best. Breastfeeding should be encouraged for at least four months. The longer it seems like the better, but it seems like after six months, this whole window of opportunity of breastfeeding has been missed. And it's important, this is exclusive breastfeeding. It's not mixed feeding. After this, there's, like I said, no benefit in allergy prevention. Continue breastfeeding while solids are being introduced. So you'll remember with the EAT study, that UK study, they introduced all these highly allergenic foods from about three to four months of age, and they continued or they told their mums to continue breastfeeding. Maternal avoidance even of highly allergenic foods should not be encouraged during breastfeeding. And I think once you embark on that journey or once you start thinking about that advice to the mum, rather speak to, a, to a, 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 either a dietitian or, a, or an allergy someone with a little bit of allergy background, because that can actually be dangerous. It can have serious implication, implications, dietary and uh, um, nutrient uh, implications to the mum and to the baby. So it has been shown in, 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 in a few studies that highly allergenic components of milk, we're talking about RH2 over mucoid, Beta lactoglobulin in, in milk has been detected in breast milk, but it actually doesn't cause any reaction. So people are postulating that it might be a more processed form of these highly allergenic components that eventually lands up in breast milk. Um, just yesterday, I saw a couple that is actually receiving a mum is on a strict elimination or a strict uh, uh, diet, and she's actually avoiding all highly uh, allergenic foods. And she actually, uh, 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 donates these breast milk, her own breast milk, to the so-called food allergenic couples. I think that's, that's, uh, 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 that's complete nonsense. I, I don't think people should, should go to extremes like that. Once again, a few studies looked at fish oils and vitamin D and probiotics during breastfeeding. Does it make a difference? And the answer is probably not. There's not enough evidence to support it. What about formula feeding? I think Shiam already mentioned this, that these so-called hypoallergenic formulas are not hypoallergenic enough. They're not hydrolyzed enough and they still can cause serious reactions. They should definitely not be used in prevent or, or in treatment of cow's milk allergy. And there's still some, some debate whether they should even be encouraged as you, as be, uh, 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 or be used as prophylaxis or as prevention of cow's milk allergy. So I think the important thing is here, no standard commercially available for formula should actually be encouraged. Avoid fresh cow's milk. I think we all know that before the age of one year because of these concerns of gut immaturity. And there's no evidence in giving soya milk to prevent allergy. It seems like you, you, uh, there, is a, there is a place for soya milk. Early soya milk in, uh, ingestion doesn't lead to increased allergy sensitization rates. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't do any harm. And it might be actually suitable for vegan or for patients with, uh, for, with religious purposes or lactose intolerance. But it definitely doesn't prevent cow's milk allergy later in life. So then the important conclusion, studies indicate that the cumulative incidence of atopic dermatitis can be reduced by using an extensively hydrolyzed casein formula. And this casein uh, principle has come from the old genie studies, 
where they found that a casein dominant mo uh, milk has been shown to slightly have a, a, a more robust effect in, in preventing cow's milk allergy. But once again, in a selected high risk infant, it's definitely not a blanket recommendation to any infant, but only in the selected high risk infant, otherwise a family history with atopic eczema or with, with, uh, with allergy. What about infant supplementation? Can we, uh, can we uh, uh, advise them to, to use any probiotics or prebiotics? Unfortunately, the exact cocktail of these pre and probiotics are currently not known. There is promising results in reducing atopic dermatitis, actually in, in high-risk infants, but this, there's no probiotic. Then the strain and the exact cocktail is just not known, but there is promising results that hopefully will be published soon. Then this whole hype about vitamin D, we all know if you look theoretically about vitamin D, vitamin D has got a lot of immune protective or immune modulatory characteristics. So theoretically, it looks like vitamin D could be the magic bullet uh, for treating uh, allergies. But if you really look at clinical trials, they recommend that supplementation of vitamin D should only be done in children that has been proven to have low vitamin D levels. Children with a high, uh, with, a, with a normal vitamin D levels, you can actually do them more harm than good by, by supplementing with vitamin D. So if you think about vitamin D supplementation, but rather do levels first, and if they are deficient, you can uh, supplement it. Then this whole concept of introducing solids, it's definitely not before three to four months of age, definitely don't delay introduction of solids, even highly allergenic foods beyond one year of age. And there's definitely no use in avoiding highly allergenic foods. We now know that. It's important when you take a history from these parents to try and identify the high risk infant, either with a family history of eczema or the child with an eczema or, a, or already pre-existing food allergy, like a milk allergy that you're thinking about introducing egg and peanut now. So in the infant with early signs of A2P, and now we've got enough evidence and I've also explained to you the principle of the dual allergen hypothesis that if you have early onset eczema with cow's milk allergy, it probably is prudent to test or discuss with a specialist or a dietitian first before you advise them to introduce these things. But please do not advise elimination. Don't just eliminate. Um, like Shaham said, there's a lot of uh, 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 nutritional compromises or a lot of nutritional problems that you can run into when you blanket or blanketly advise uh, uh, food elimination. So egg introduction, the, the current guidelines is now to introduce egg at small amounts, well-cooked egg, not raw egg, so well-cooked, meaning basically an extensively heated form of egg from four to six months of life. Introduce egg alongside with breastfeeding and do it before peanut introduction. Start with about a half of a well-cooked small egg. So well-cooked meaning it's either a hard-boiled egg that's either present in bread containing or a hard-boiled egg itself, cookies, cupcakes, muffins, and, and, and other forms of cake, but less well-cooked egg like pancakes, pa pastas, scrambled egg should be then given later after uh, it has been established that this infant uh, is fairly safe to introduce egg. So what about peanuts? So once again, we know now that the risk stratification is quite important. The low risk infant with no family hinder, uh, member with food allergy or eczema or egg allergy, you can introduce it freely into the diet. And like we said, peanut should probably not be the first solid to be, uh, to be introduced, rather start with, with egg first. Your high risk infants, I'll show you the protocol that's been based on the LEAP principle is once again starting with a fairly low dose, around two grams, and two grams is basically two teaspoons of peanut butter mixed with warm water, breast milk, pureed food, or even formula milk. And then after that's been or, or, or shown to, to be tolerated, then you can introduce uh, higher forms or, or, or bigger servings of peanut. And then once again, this three, two gram servings per week has been, uh, uh, is based on what they found in the LEAP study or what they've used in the UK LEAP study. So based on the LEAP study, and once again, it should be remember or always remember this is from a high risk population, children with severe egg allergy or severe eczema or both, 
it's from a developed country like the UK. So how much of this can we really use in South Africa? I think we basically do, do the same here and it's been shown to be quite effective. I think for you as general pediatricians, whenever you see a child that you suspect is having food allergy or a severe egg, egg allergy or, 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 or eczema, do an IgE first. So Shaham did mention about IgE testing. If your IgE is low, that is generally uh, regarded as 0.35 kilo units per liter or lower, you probably have a very low risk of a child having a, a, or a high risk of a negative skin prick test. In other words, a very low risk of that child reaction or reacting to, to peanuts. So this should be then a discussion with the parents. The parents' preferences should be kept in mind. You can either introduce peanut freely at, at home, but let's be honest, a lot of these patients or parents are quite concerned and they should often then do a supervised feeding in the office. And there's absolutely nothing scientific about this, what we also call in layman's term a corridor challenge. You basically let the child come in the morning, quick examination, make sure they, they are fine, and then basically give them a teaspoon of peanut butter. If they don't react within an hour or two, the mum can actually go home and then she can introduce peanut freely in this child's diet. If there's any sensitization, and this is the important concept about sensitization versus true allergy, it's not to say that if you are sensitized to a food allergen, you are necessarily truly allergic to that. And this is where, where a bit of specialist consultation will probably be useful. Discuss it with a food allergy specialist, speak to a dietitian before you just blindly eliminate uh, these foods from a child's diet. And then your green one, if you have access to skin prick test, the vast majority of you know, you uh, uh, of pediatricians won't do skin prick test in their, in their busy clinic practice. But I think the important thing is once again, stratify according to sensitization. And if you have severe egg allergy or, or severe eczema or egg allergy or even both, and you have a, a fairly big size, a wheel size, I think once again, discuss this with, with an, an allergy, uh, food allergy uh, specialist or, a, or, a, or someone that has got interest in food allergies. So once again, if you think about introducing fin uh, uh, solids from about three to four months of age, different textures, different flavors, different colors should be in this child's diet. We want to diversify the diet as, as far as possible. And um, it's also got to do with, with the, or, 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 or it's an important aspect when you look at, at the development of the child's uh, or milestones. Also age appropriate amounts should be given. We often look on or generally or abroad or as a rule of thumb will then be a child that can sit up, a child with fairly good neck control will be able to swallow uh, uh, um, or safely swallow these, these foods or, or, or so, uh, solids. And then it's quite important to also look at age appropriate amounts. I think peanuts, when it comes to peanuts and eggs specifically, it can be quite lumpy. It does have the, the, the hazard or the easy hazard, hazard of choking. There's a choking hazard. So I think make sure it's in an age appropriate amount and preparation for the child to swallow. And then after that, a careful monitoring of the child's weight and height will then be important. I think Jam also touched or mentioned the important, importance of that. I think for us in South Africa dealing with malnutrition, we often look at downward crossing of centiles, but it's so important to also avoid upward crossing of centiles because that can also predispose you to food allergy. And then like we said, even if you just take this message home today of taking a good history and then um, you can do your baseline investigations, but the moment you see there's, there's anything above 0 0.35 kilo units per liter, rather discuss or refer early. Unfortunately, there's no clear evidence available to prevent fish wheat and other forms of, of, of food allergy and non-IgE mediated food allergies. So once again, just to summarize the timing of food, the levels of evidence, we've got good level of a high level of evidence that peanuts should be introduced from four to 11 months of age, obviously not in the form of whole peanut. Uh, hence, egg can be introduced a little bit sooner and should actually be introduced before a uh, 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 peanut and cooked egg rather than raw egg, scrambled or, or baked egg should, should then be introduced. But unfortunately, when it comes to milk, wheat and fish, there's no specific timing uh, of, of, of recommendation and even the recommendation for soya 
is, is less clear. So just for, for interest sake, I think milk uh, from, from the dietitian's point of view, I think recently, Shaham, you can help me with that, but a few years back, uh, the, the South African food-based dietary guidelines were changed. And in the Road to Health booklet of every child, you will find from about one year of age, it is actually now advised to give pasteurized full cream cow's milk, but then the addition of Mars and yogurt. So I think uh, maybe the whole nutrition or the nutrition dense properties of, of these products were, were, uh, uh, were appreciated. But I think once again, it comes back to the uh, what specifically to lactic acid bacteria and their end and byproducts that's 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 in these these products that might be beneficial to specifically preventing cow's milk allergy so um, let's see maybe in the near future we can advise every child to to consume specifically fermented milk as a as a way of increasing richness and diversity in the gut fairly early in life Skin barrier protection, I think it's quite obviously, use emollients from birth as a preventative strategy. We want to do everything in our ability to try and avoid or to try and, and, and prevent breakdown of the skin barrier. So soaps, detergents, uh, these are all been shown to, to, uh, to disrupt your skin's pH and then also disrupt your skin barrier. And then treat aggressively, treat eczema aggressively and skin infections aggressively. So I think it's quite important to recognize that skin infection, uh, skin infections, specifically Staph aureus, can be detrimental when it comes to, 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 to specifically skin barrier breakdown. And then this concept is quite important. And if you take this home today, I think it's quite important or it's, it's, it's um, our job here was achieved. And it's basically to educate parents that it's in only a small amount of, of patients will food allergy cause atopic dermatitis. It's actually the other way around. So when you see atopic dermatitis, do not embark on the journey of eliminating foods blindly. I think treat atopic dermatitis completely separately. Atopic dermatitis is an inborn error or, or is a genetic problem of skin barrier defect. It's not because of a food allergy. So do not eliminate things from a child's diet when you think uh, uh, the child has got atopic dermatitis. So what about wheat and fish? There's a few things that we actually don't know. Um, I think a lot of these studies, like I've said, has been studies from first world or developed countries. Can we extrapolate this from South Africa? Unfortunately, that's currently what we have. And then the role of the microbiome in preventing allergy. We just do not know what the strain, the dose, the duration, and even the route at, of ad administration is. And we even know less about the metabolic biome in products when it comes to these these organisms. It seems like new studies must focus on rather than on identifying these organisms, they should be also look at their metabolic ways of, of interacting with the immune system. And then it's, it's quite evident that we don't know if the role of our dietary interventions may also prevent uh, 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 aero allergy or, or respiratory allergies like asthma and allergic rhinitis. So these are definitely uh, uh, aspects for, for future research. So what, to conclude, I think, uh, how do we prevent allergies, specifically gastrointestinal allergy in 2020? There's now sufficient evidence that early life programming of the immune system plays an important role. And this, this already probably starts in utero. And this is where this whole first thousand, thousand days concept comes, comes from. So it's basically a child from conception to about two years of age. So this is your, uh, your, your window of opportunity to get things right, get a diverse microbiome um, um, appropriate for allergy prevention. It's quite important that when you speak to patients about interventions, make sure it's actually feasible. So just yesterday I saw a couple, they were actually twins and they were on, on an amino acid formula to try and prevent food allergy cause their, their older son has got severe eczema and cow's milk allergy. And I mean, we all know how expensive amino acid formula, formula is. So make sure that it's actually evidence-based stuff and not something that you read off on the internet or, or recommendations from Facebook. You now know how important it is to protect the newborn skin barrier and the microbiome. 
I mean, lectures on the microbiome is a complete topic on its own, but general, it's been, generally it's been found that normal vaginal delivery and breastfeeding promotes a good, healthy, diverse and a rich microbiome and prescription of or, or liberal prescription of antibiotics specifically early in life should be prevented. Do not encourage empirical blank or food avoidance strategies, have good evidence for that, and refer early and discuss with either an allergist, dietitian, or both if you are unsure. Okay, and that's my story. There's my contact details, so um, you're welcome to, to send me an email or ask questions. Are there any questions from from um no peter it's byro so yeah i'm playing tag with mignon tonight because the yes. show must go on in the hospital yes okay uh, thanks Peter. i see there's a few questions in the chat box from okay. Joa. um she's asking to what extent does genetic predisposition contribute to the development of allergies and does that affect the age at which the child outgrow the allergy. Yes, so so currently, you know, it's 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 an it's an excellent question. Um, that is actually been shown when specifically when it comes to to respiratory allergy. That's the only real robust uh, tool that we have to predict allergy in the offspring. So so allergy is is or genetic predisposition is probably the only thing that we currently have to predict allergy in the in the offspring. So it's, it's, it's a vital importance. And nowadays, specifically when it, comes to, when it comes to asthma, food allergy may be to a lesser extent predicting a genetic, uh, a, a genetics predicting food allergy, but definitely asthma now first relative or first degree relative. So that's either mom or dad or both or brothers or sisters is, is an excellent predictor of, of, of food allergy. Unfortunately, as far as I know, genetics has not really been shown to, to indicate or to help with prognosis of outgrowing your allergy. Uh, we now know that the sooner your allergy start, the, the sooner you present with eczema, um, the more or the more severe or the more less likely, or maybe the, the longer it will take for your allergy to be outgrown. But when it comes to genetics and food allergy, maybe less so, but definitely genetics and aero allergy is a, it's a, it's a strong predictor. Thank you. I think we, we need to ask the next question to Shyam. Shyam, are you still on the call? Yeah, yes, I'm here. Um, I think it's a question from Dave, from Martin Davis, um, or no, from Donna Hraylen. Would you recommend elimination of dietary allergens if the patient, usually a toddler, has only mild allergic reactions? such as a rash. Uh, yeah, so, so Peter uh, also perhaps help me with this. So what we normally do is if it has a severe reaction and um, that's actually causing a problem to the child, yes, then we would. If it's mild, then it would depend on other aspects. Perhaps it needs a medical intervention, for example, the eczema is just under treated. So it needs to be a clear um, um, intake and reaction to actually suggest that it could be a culprit food. Um, but we wouldn't need to say if you've got a generalized mild allergic reaction to necessarily eliminate. Peter, if you want to add? Yeah, no, no, definitely, I agree. So that's probably where your where your history taking plays an important role. I think the moment you see a child having a, a rash, you need to to determine whether it was anaphylaxis or not, and how it was treated. Obviously, if you progress to anything like a multi-system involvement that would indicate a more severe type of reaction. But generally cutaneous symptoms we can treat quite effectively with, um, with local, local treatment and antihistamines. Thank you. And I think our last question is from Martin Davids. Um, component allergy studies in difficult food allergies. Do you want to comment on that testing? Uh, so I'm not sure, Martin, maybe you can just elaborate or explain a little bit on that uh, question. So do you want to know how important component testing is when it comes to food allergy? Um, or is this, the, as far as I know, component testing 
has basically been uh, been used to predict outgrowing your allergy and then it's also an important tool to use to indicate whether you are you may tolerate an allergen in a more extensively or, 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 or heated form than a fresh fresh form i see martin you are there yes i'm here um the i think first of all component food component testing is being done too often the so-called isaac 112 study um but i mean certainly in certain food allergens and and looking at things like ara h um, um looking at bars and or looking at all the other allergens they may be important to tell the patient whether perhaps a milk is heat labile or an egg is heat labile allergic those kind of things are difficult ones i don't think it should be abused but i think that in um, certainly in our practices we're using it for those kind of particular reasons i don't know if that makes it clearer yeah no definitely i think when it comes to isaac studies and um uh and and cast studies and stuff you 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 are opening a window of of getting results that you probably won't know what to do with so isaacs are quite good when it comes to other forms of 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 allergy testing but i think isaac studies in food allergy testing has not really been validated and you're going to find probably a lot of results that you don't know what to do with so i think it's a good and I think also um, it also helps you with the profilins and the, and the cross and the cross allergens. So many children might be being treated who have just got cross, cross sensitizations and shouldn't be. Yeah, absolutely. Now you can you can really fall into a sea of cross reactions and co reactions when you do Isaac studies, and it makes it incredibly difficult. And that's probably where auto food challenges still comes in as the gold standard of diagnosing food allergy. On the one side I want to say that we shouldn't make food allergy too complicated otherwise especially just looking at blood blood test results otherwise it's it we're going to 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 unnecessarily eliminate things from a child's diet that's not really clinically relevant. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Peter, I think it looks like we've not got any further questions um gone through all the questions i really like to thank peter and shiham for me as an intensivist this is not my field but i've learned a lot of new things and exciting new data so thank you both for sharing um with us tonight your talks we have recorded this and we will send through a link for the recording those guys who've been on call tonight that would like to watch this later thank you shiam and peter and thank you everybody for joining us tonight hope you have a peaceful evening and we'll see you next month thank you.